Welcome to Dementia Resilience with Jill Lorenz, a candid conversation as we learn about types of dementias, such as Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, frontal temporal, and Lewy body, and the effects on the people we love. Jill's years of dedication and experience help you adapt, overcome obstacles, and find positive outcomes. It's time for Dementia Resilience with Jill Lorenz. Well, welcome, everybody. I'm really pleased today to have a new person in the studio who hasn't been with us before, Dr. Stacy Friedenthal. Hi, Stacy. Hi. It's terrific to have you here. We've got an interesting subject to talk about today. Um, it's not one that a lot of people like to talk out loud about, which is people who think about taking their own lives. Mm-hmm. For whatever reason, they are considering it. We want to be thoughtful about the subject today. And I'm going to start by just giving your bio. Is that okay? Sure. All right. So you are a Denver psychotherapist, consultant, and educator. And you're an author as well of Helping the Suicidal Person, Tips and Techniques for Professionals. You've created and maintained a wonderful website, by the way, that I went on this week called Speaking of Suicide. And um, you also have another website called helpingthesuicidalperson.com. She's authored numerous articles and presentations on suicide. In addition to that, you're an associate professor at the University of Denver Graduate School of Social Work. Correct. Yeah, and you have research and scholarship topics related to suicide risk and intervention. You conduct training workshops, give presentations, and teach graduate courses on suicide prevention and other clinical topics. I love that, and welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Of course. So the reason I wanted to bring you on the show in the first place was someone that is a client of mine who happens to have Parkinson's disease, thought it was important to have this subject and talk about uh, thoughts about ending his own life, not being judged on it. Um, And he was able to pull himself up out of those thoughts, which was great. But then he decided not to be on the show. Um, So I'm not sure what happened after that. But so Stacy. Tell me how you got involved in this field in the first place. This is a, this is an interesting subject, an emotional subject. Yes, yes. Suicide is a very sensitive, tragic subject. Yeah, you know, suicide has brought suffering to many people as well as suicidal thoughts and suicide attempts. And, and for me, my interest in suicide started, I think, probably when I was in high school. It's when. I really had kind of searing questions about suicide, and that's when I was a sophomore. Mm -hmm. There were two suicides in my school, in my class. Um, So the first suicide was somebody who I knew, but I didn't know well, like I knew who he was. I could describe to you right now what he typically wore. Right. (laughs) So, you know, I have a very vivid image of him in my mind. And that really shook us up that somebody we knew had died by suicide. And then five days later, it was a good friend of mine who who killed himself. Wow. And we had all been at a party with him the night before, or Mm -hmm. actually the night of, because I learned about it the next day. But after we left the party, he went home and he ended his life. And we had just been with him. Wow. And you really must have been stunned by that. And I don't think this is something that is foreign to our country at this time. Even around the world, we're hearing about more and more teens um, feeling these emotions and feeling this way. Your thoughts on that? Well, it's really staggering. I don't know if you've looked at statistics from the last almost 20 years, but since 1999 in the United States, the suicide rate has gone up almost 40 percent. Wow. And in the 10 to 14-year-old age group, it's gone up more than 100 percent. Why do you think that is? Do you have any thoughts on that? I I can only conjecture. Sure. You know, I mean, we don't really – we don't know. And with suicide, there's a lot more that – there's a lot more hypotheses than facts. I would guess that to be true. And, you know, you can have 
a, a child who seems like they're just doing really well. Um, and then all of a sudden, I saw a show on this uh, very subject just last week on television that a, a 14-year-old girl was top of her class, excelling in every way, um, doing very well. And she was writing in a journal how much she was struggling. And no one around her could see that. No. I, I read that article. Yeah. The, the girl in Boston, right? Yes. Oh, God. Brought me to tears. I'm telling you. Me too. <laughs> and you just don't think that a 10-year-old is going to be struggling. You don't think, you you know, at 14, adolescence, so on and so forth, um, we know kids struggle. And in my field, we talk about people with Alzheimer's and, and Parkinson's disease, uh, frontal temporal and Lewy body, difficult, difficult neurological disorders. And um, th this is the group I work with, and they have questions around this that we're going to get to later in the show. Um, but how do you help someone who's thinking this way? What techniques do you use? Let's start with professionals. How do you help professionals work with this? I could use some help in this. <laughs> well, how much time do you have? <laughs> <laughs> right? You know, you try to be uh, supportive. You know, I try to be supportive to people. I don't want to be judge and jury. But there's some real emotional problems going on, people feeling lonely in their life that reach depths that we don't realize. Yeah, and I think that's a huge challenge when working with somebody who has suicidal thoughts is we as clinicians have our own fears and anxieties. Mm -hmm. And I think many clinicians, when they're talking with somebody who has suicidal thoughts, are reacting to their fears, and it gets in the way of attending to the person's needs. Right. You know, because in their mind, they're thinking, I have to get all this information, and I need to be able to document it all, and I need to make sure that they stay safe. And if, I, if they don't stay safe, then I could be sued or I could lose my license. Mm. And then meanwhile, the person's not being listened to. Right. You know, so one of the things I really preach um, in in my trainings is to really, truly, and non-judgmentally listen. And yeah. even, you know, even if it is painful to hear what people are thinking and feeling, even if there's an urge to jump in and say, it gets better, you know, don't give up hope. You Just know? exercise, release endorphins. Right. I mean, <laughs> right. you know, often when people jump in with advice or encouragement, they're well-intentioned, but it's also a way to relieve their own anxiety. Right. Yeah. Oh, and that's huge. That's huge. So I went on your website and was blown away at your blog. <laughs> your information for people is astounding. <laughs> Thank you. And I learned so much. I was on there, I think, close to three hours. I think I read every single one of them. Wow. Yeah. I mean, it was amazing <laughs> you to go. me. <laughs> uh, just because I get a lot of questions around this and I want to... I want to try to silently understand if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. I don't want to try to talk anybody into anything. I don't want to talk anybody out of anything. I just want to listen, mm -hmm. you know, to my clients and send them to people like you who can really help them. That's not in my wheelhouse, you know, but I'm finding it more and more. Mm -hmm. I'm hearing more and more about it. Um, one of your blogs was why I came out of the suicide closet. I could afford to tell my story. Mm -hmm. Cool. I yeah. love that. It took me quite a few years. Yeah. <laughs> so in my 20s, I had um, very intense suicidal thoughts, and I actually did attempt suicide. And um, and I was in my MSW program in 1995, 6. It was kind of on the cusp. I think it was January of 96. And I made a suicide attempt while I was studying to become a psychotherapist, you know. And so wow. it felt to me like, you know, my emotional difficulties felt to me like a very big liability. Mm -hmm. And so I, I hit them. But you said something very empowering. I want to read this. You said, as an associate professor at the University of Denver Graduate School of Social Work, I have tenure. <laughs> I'm not going to get fired if I reveal my past. You go. I love that. <laughs> you know, because if you can't say it out loud, 
how are people going to relate to you? You don't have to have a suicide attempt to be a good therapist in this area. All right? You exactly. Don't. But if I'm feeling that way and you felt that way and you're, you, you're sitting here now talking to me, I feel like you, you, you're helpful. Well, because well, you're still you. here. <laughs> you know what I mean? I am still here. And yeah. and I think, you know, I think you're right that it, you know, that people who do come out about their lived experience with suicide or suicidal behavior and thoughts that they can sort of be models for others that right. you know that others can look and see. You know, if all people hear about is the people who die and they don't hear about the people who did grow through it, then that's going to be a distorted view. But I think another value, and I'm not just speaking of myself because there are very significant figures who came before me and disclosed their own suicidal past and influenced me in inspiring me to disclose my own. I think when people do disclose their their past, whether it be suicidality or mental illness or some other stigmatized condition, addiction, you know, what have you, it gives others permission to share their story. Right. You know, and then the more people who share their story, the less stigma there will be, the less shame there will be. And in these stigma and shame inhibit people from getting help. You know, that actually transcends across a lot of areas. Uh, I say the same thing about people with Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. Don't be afraid to talk about it. I talk about it. I talk about it in my family and and so on and so forth because I don't want that shame and stigma yep. on that either. You know, it's a disease. And um, even if somebody is feeling really down, lost their purpose, can't seem to come up from it, um, it doesn't mean they're crazy. It just means that they need to work through some things maybe to get through to the other side. You, one of your blogs was the three-day rule. Yes. Yeah, will you talk about that? Yeah, I, I didn't, thought that was really insightful. Well, I didn't come up with it. Uh, I <laughs> I had read it on another blog that I and then I excerpted from that blog in my post. And what this person said is that whenever she has a really difficult decision to make, no matter what it is, you know, it could be buying a car. Right. She waits three days before acting on it to see, you know, where her thoughts go. Okay. And the idea with suicide is, if somebody's having suicidal thoughts. Yeah, you know, those suicidal thoughts easily can last more than three days. But will the intent exist to the same degree throughout those three days? That's unlikely. You know, usually there's variation in the intent to act. So if someone's in an extremely dangerous place of intending to act on their suicidal thoughts, if they can wait three days and be honest about The way the intent ebbs and flows, Mm -hmm. you know, really be curious about it and acknowledge it and start the clock over whenever it goes down. Right. Then three days may become many, many days that they wait. Now, some people leave comments on that post and they're quite angry. There was one recently where he said, so what, you think people should kill themselves after three days if if – They still want to. And no, absolutely not. That's not my intended message. And in the post, I say, if after three days you still feel this way, please get help. Right. You know, but suicidality exists on a spectrum. And, you know, you can have people who just have suicidal thoughts every now and then at one end of the spectrum and they immediately, you know, push them out of their – those thoughts out of their mind and Mm -hmm. they're not influenced by them anyway. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you can have someone who's thinking of suicide – Every moment and can't stop and feels pulled to act on them. Right. Well, the three-day rule, you know, is probably more likely to help people on the on the lesser end of the spectrum. Hey, I think you have to start somewhere. Yeah. Right. You just yeah. have to start somewhere, and you're always going to get people that um, are super emotional about anything and and try to read into what you're saying or read more into it. And that's not helpful or that really is helpful or whatever it is. But something that was helpful, you had another post that said, so what can you do about suicidal thoughts? And you had several paths that you offered that I thought were just great. I mean, really great (laughs) stuff. Uh, You can learn to talk back to the suicidal thoughts. Yep. Yep. What does that mean? Well, don't believe what they're telling you. 
You know, don't accept them as facts. You know, defend yourself. So, you know, suicidal thoughts look different for different people, but something that I commonly hear is people think they'll be a burden. I mean, that they are a burden to others and that if they kill themselves, then they'll be relieving others of that burden. Well, what's the other side of that argument? Right. You know, right. that's one side. And, and there's a, a quote that I read that I just love about how we all or most of us have a prosecutor living inside our head that wow. criticizes every mistake we make and, you know, indicts us constantly. Right. But many of us don't have a defense attorney. Oh, wow. That's awesome. <laughs> I love that. That's good. That's really good. So that goes to the second thing that you said. You can learn to observe your thoughts without feeling the need to act on them. Yeah. Act. Don't react. Right? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. And I mean, this really comes from principles of mindfulness and even even, um, Eastern traditions such as Buddhism, you know, where people train themselves to observe their thoughts as, as sort of for example, leaves floating on a stream that you can let pass you by and you're paying attention to them, but you're not clinging to them and you're not um, attached to them. It's easier said than done, but it is possible. It's quite possible. And the idea is that somebody can have suicidal thoughts and can observe them and, and, you know, they may say to themselves, well, there go my suicidal thoughts again. Well, that's all about like redirection and distraction as well. And that's the next thing you talked about was how to distract yourself from those suicidal suicidal thoughts. So um, having something more interesting to do, get yourself up and maybe take a walk. Breathe the air. Look, feel the sunshine. Well, and... and Too simplistic? No. And actually what I'm going to say might sound simplistic, but I've had several people – I mean I say several. I've had many people tell me that playing video games helps them. Really? Or doing some kind of puzzle. And over time what I've come to recognize about this is that it's helping the person get out of the emotion-saturated part of their mind into the more analytic or problem-solving logical Mm -hmm. part of their mind, and that can get their mind off of the things that are fueling their suicidal thoughts. And by the way, that's also a piece of dialectical behavior therapy, the idea that we have emotion mind and we have reason reasoning mind or reasonable mind and that often these two don't intersect. Mm -hmm. And when they don't intersect, that's what gets us in trouble. And Mm -hmm. when they do intersect, it's called wise mind. And so if we can help people move from that place of pure emotion to also um, connect with logic, it's Mm -hmm. the logical side that can help people talk back to their suicidal thoughts. Nice. You know, that can help people, um, you know, say, wait a minute, this isn't rational. You know, know, I'm not – I'm not a burden to the people I love. Or even even if they are burdened by worrying about me, they'd be much more burdened by my death. Do do people really think that way when they're in that state? Oh, yeah, that they're a burden to others? No, that they that the people that they're leaving behind would be devastated. Is that is that Oh. Some... Um, you know, I think that's a big deterrent for many people who still have the the ability and the presence of mind to let that touch them, okay. you know? And then I think some people enter this kind of state of mind where that doesn't touch them anymore because they don't feel connected to others mm-hmm. or they, um, you know, their mind is being very cruel to them and is telling them that they're worthless or, you know, that that – and what I hear, and I even hear this from adolescents sometimes who are my clients, is that they'll get over it. Yeah. You know, so I've had adolescents say about their parents, yeah, they'll be sad for a, a couple of months and then they'll get over it. And I'm here to tell you it's not that it's not that easy. You know, I mean, wow. that's a uh, wow. I mean, I, I I'm a parent and I could never never feel like that could be the case. You know what I mean? Yeah. So so with that, one of the things that you talked about was 
envision your future. Yeah. So how do you if you're if you feel suicidal, envision your future. If they're not seeing their purpose now, if they're feeling worthless, if they feel like nobody's going to care or they'll get over it quickly if I'm not here any longer, how do you redirect them to more positive thoughts of seeing a future that's hopeful? Mm-hmm. Well, so the things I write in my blog may be different from the things I do as a therapist. Okay, that's all right. Because the blog is more kind of self helpy You know, yeah, people right. are coming and they're reading it and I'm not talking – you know, there can't be a conversation – and so what I wrote in the blog about Envision Your Future Selves is rather direct. Mm-hmm. And when I work with people in person, my intention is to help them get to their answers yeah. rather than to impose my answers. Okay, that's fair. But also they have to have that first touch. And that first touch has to be uh, read, uh, learn engage somehow. Oh, so, yeah. So the value of that uh, for me, I, I mean, I do not feel that way. I'm a pretty positive person. But um, not to say I haven't had anxiety or different things, you know, when I get deep into something and say, geez, am I, <laughs> how, did I get, how did I get here? Or, or should I go this direction? And, you know, the self-doubts that people just naturally have, but they're, they're just... Um, exponential exponential in people that um are struggling in this yeah. way it's a it's a different different ball game does it does it work to help them envision their future yeah so i realize i didn't really answer your question i just wanted to be clear that it's okay. the post sounds kind of bossy it's telling people <laughs> here's what you need to do but in person i'm not bossy you know mm-hmm. i'm more collaborative mm-hmm. and um so i just wanted to make that clear um so you know the hallmark of the suicidal mind is almost always there's ambivalence, you know, and almost always there's a, a part of that person, and it may be a very, very tiny part. It may be the size of a grain of salt. Right. But there's a part of the person that has doubts. Right. So um, I ask questions that are designed to help the person connect with the part that has doubts so that then they can make a fair and informed decision right. about what they're thinking of doing. And the part that wants to live deserves a say, too. Oh, I love that. I love that. I, I bet that's a little bit hard to get somebody there, though. But I, I that's a powerful thing to say to somebody. I bet you get a lot of, uh, uh, you know, paused, thoughtful looks, people being enlightened when you say that. The person that wants to live deserves a say too. Yeah, yeah, they deserve yeah. A, a a say in that decision. Yeah, and so that's where the phrase "envision your future selves" comes from. It's that what about your future self? Do they get a say in this decision? Right. You know, because right now, I mean, this this is especially true for young people like adolescents. Right. You know, what will the twenty five year old self who, you know, could be thriving right you know want mm-hmm. right now do they do they want you would they want you to end their life you know to help people kind of get out of this tunnel vision of the way i feel now is the way i will feel forever right so this is personal to me mm-hmm. uh, last year it's been a year ago on new year's eve One of my best friends took her own life. Oh, I'm so sorry. And it blew me away because she was the most caring, vibrant uh, person, always there to help other people. Uh, She had a 16-year-old daughter. She was a single mom, Um, a vet, a veteran. Um, but she, she looked like the Hollywood girl. She'd always uh, pictures of herself with, you know, this great makeup on and huge glasses and pink lipstick and, and, uh, life of the party. If there was somebody new to the, to our world, you know, in our groups that we all run in, you know, for, for, uh, our businesses, she was the first to take you to coffee, right? I was supposed to have lunch with her on Tuesday. And she canceled uh, right after Christmas, right? 
And um, she just said she wasn't feeling well. She didn't tell me why. Mm -hmm. And we rescheduled for Friday, and she didn't show up. And I knew something just didn't quite feel right. She'd missed a few appointments. Should have been red flags hitting us in the face. But she used a gun and shot herself. Mm. And I struggle. I don't get emotional very often. I'm going to get emotional here. Why I didn't see or was I not a good enough friend Mm. that she felt she could open up? I mean, we were friends. I think... All of us, there was a group of about eight of us that just, we can't get over it. So you're talking about the kids saying, well, somebody will get over it. She was a friend. She's not even my child. She was a friend. I struggle with it. I mean, people will uh, I, people will tell you I can be a rock, and I, I got tears in my eyes right now. It's, uh, it's a, I don't understand. Yeah, yeah. I don't understand what happened. And those questions are so painful. Oh, they're horrible. The questions of why didn't she tell me? And that's actually what happened with my friend. His name was Sippy. Right. Short for Cipriano. Sorry, gosh. And I remember very vividly going outside and and sitting on the curb. And I I remember I looked up at the sky and it was this gorgeous shade of blue. Right. And I thought, like, why did he want to leave that? Oh, yeah. I know. I mean, I'm telling you, at the at the memorial service for Kai, my friend Kylie, uh, there were a thousand people there. I mean, the room was packed. How did she not know how loved she was? Yeah. How did we miss the despair she felt? Well, I, I would assume, not knowing her and not knowing yeah. your your friends, but I would assume she hid it very well. Oh gosh, off the chart. I mean, just off the chart. And when we, uh, we're going to take a break in just a minute, but when, when we come back, one of the blogs that you wrote that said, if only the self blame that we feel after somebody we love ends their own life um, is devastating. Yes. And every so often, and it happened again just the other day, uh, where somebody put up a picture of her and said how much they missed her and how much they, something, made them think of her. And uh, I, if, if, if I can give one hopeful message <laughs> before we go to break to anybody that is thinking that they're not worth it or they are not loved, I am to this day, and I, I can't see a day when I'm not devastated by the loss of my friend. Mm. I loved her, and we were friends. And... Uh, they, people need to understand, and especially parents of children um, that don't understand or didn't see something coming, you will be missed. If Oh, for gosh sakes, if you can tell somebody, call a professional, call a family member, just talk to somebody who's not going to judge you about where you are. Uh, I, I just feel like if Kylie just would have known, we wouldn't have judged her. But in the next section, one of the things we're going to talk about is uh, the things you should not say to someone. And so we're going to take a break and we'll be right back. Living and working with Alzheimer's and other dementias can often be challenging. Summit Resilience Training provides education, utilizing non-medical approaches for those who work with our friends affected by dementia. Believing families still need one-on-one assistance, we provide classes which help them understand the diseases affecting their loved ones, offering strategies and techniques for success with activities of daily living and working with confusing behaviors. We offer in-home assessments to clarify symptoms of dementia diseases and help families work together to find moments of joy while living with memory loss and impairment. Education programs instilling person-centered care philosophies are offered for professional caregivers working in communities and homes, which can be customized for their staff. Training is also available for first responders, such as law enforcement, fire, and EMT personnel. We are passionate that people with dementias, such as Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and others, are approached with compassion and understanding, and those who work with them have all the tools they need for success. Call us at Summit Resilience Training, 303-420-6988 to schedule a class or in-home assessment. Visit our website at summitresiliencetraining.com for more information. 
Welcome back to Dementia Resilience with Jill Lorenz, a candid conversation as we learn about types of dementias, such as Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, frontal temporal, and Lewy body, and their effects on the people we love. Okay, so I'm back today with Stacy Friedenthal. And Stacy, uh, I call my listeners Caregiver Nation. Um, we have listeners all around the world and in various states, and I just wanted you to know that if we give some information about where they can go for resources. Before we move on, uh, I was talking about my friend Kylie. Uh, was there anything you wanted to, to finish up with to wrap up that last segment? Yeah. Yeah. I was having some thoughts while you were talking, and that's that, first of all, it's extremely painful and poignant the things you were saying about if only she had known how much she was loved and there were a thousand people at the funeral, yeah, you know. And that's absolutely true. I think it's also important to be mindful that even when people recognize that they're loved, they're in pain. And and so they're in pain or they're um, experiencing other forces that are making them are moving them to end their life. And we definitely need to do everything we can to try to help that person. Mm-hmm. And showing love is one thing we can do, but it, it, it may not be enough. enough. Because, right. you know, I, I just want to be careful that one, that somebody who is having suicidal thoughts isn't made to think that they need to think of other people in such a way that then they're not attending to their own pain. Right. And two, that when people do die by suicide, it's not that the friends, their friends and family failed them, you know, by not showing them love. You know, someone could be the most loved person in the world and be aware of it on an intellectual level. But they're in so much pain that that's not what they're thinking about. And I compare it to like, A toothache, I don't know if you've ever had an abscess tooth, but uh, I did once, and Mm -hmm. it is profoundly painful. All you can think about is this tiny little piece of your body that is exerting tremendous pain. And, you know, so it may be all that the person can think about. Right. One of the things you said was talking about where blame lies. Mm Mm-hmm. And I just want to read something that you said. The illusion of control, the reality of control, and placing blame where it belongs. When somebody dies by suicide, it's never one person's fault. It's not your fault. It's not my fault. It's not even the person that dies by suicide's fault. So what's it about? Is it about mental illness? Is it is it undiagnosed Uh, mental illness? Is it just unmet needs? Is it, what is it? It can be many things. For some people, it's mental illness. Mm -hmm. Um, Suicide is uh, elevated in almost all of the, with people with almost all of the mental illnesses, but especially um, in the bipolar disorder, in anorexia, in borderline personality disorder, and addiction. Those have you know, rather elevated rates of suicide compared to the general population. Okay. So mental illness can can be a force that fuels suicidal thinking, but it also could be extreme stress. It could be um, intoxication. Mm-hmm. Someone could be under the influence of drugs or alcohol. Right. It could be a psychotic episode, which is mental illness. It could be trauma. It could be sleep deprivation. Right. You know, so so many, many different forces can contribute to suicide. But what I like to think of it as is I have – let me back up for a moment. I have a post called, Is It Selfish to Die in a Tornado?, and this was a reaction to – there had been a suicide in Dallas, and it, oh, it was so tragic. It was a woman whose husband had been murdered while jogging by somebody who had a machete, and it was a stranger, and he just attacked her husband, and her husband died. Wow. And she was in profound grief. Right. And a week or two later killed herself. Oh, wow. 
And somebody in a letter to the editor wrote about how selfish she was. Ooh. Wow. And that hurt to that's, read that. That's cold. Yeah. Yeah, that, I mean, wow. So I was inspired by that to write this post. I bet you were. Where I said, you know, when somebody dies in a tornado, we don't say they were selfish for not holding on tighter to the tree. Right. That's a great analogy. Deep. That's that's (laughs) deep. Thanks. And I do believe that suicidality is like a tornado in the head. Oh, yeah. I, I I agree. I think that's I that's a good one. I I think that really hits to the the to the crux of of what's going on. I think you really just absolutely nailed it. So, from a a friend standpoint, a family member standpoint, um, you had written another blog about ten common responses that can discourage the person from telling you more about how they're feeling. Um, And you said, first, a caveat. In general, these statements can convey judgment and foster alienation. But depending on the context, some people might respond positively to at least some of these responses. That's a fair statement. But let's go through a couple of these. The first one is, how could you think of suicide? Your life's not that bad. Wow. I, I guarantee you – well, I shouldn't say I guarantee. I mostly guarantee you that if you say that to someone who discloses that they're thinking of suicide, they are not going to say, oh, my God, you're right. I feel much better now. Right. <laughs> you're right. I have so much to live for. My life isn't bad. Right. And this this might be something I might have said to Kylie, number two. I hate thinking that way, but don't you know that I would be devastated if you killed yourself? How could you think of hurting me like that? It's not about me, but you know what I mean? Like I I probably would have said to her, you're so loved, you know, don't you understand all the people that will be hurt? Maybe putting it that way, but they're already feeling bad. So let's just pile it on a little bit, huh? Well, that's that's the challenge is, I mean, you know, you're human. I'm human. We don't want the people we love to die. Right. And we will be devastated. Right. You know. Especially when we think they have so much to offer, even if they can't see that. Right. And and also when you firmly believe that if they get help and, and get through this, they won't want to die anymore. Right. You know, so, I, you know, I don't think it's it's – terrible to say that or to have that thought, but we need to be mindful of the effect it can have on the person who's disclosing their suicidal thoughts because then they can feel like, oh, I can't talk to her about it because it will stress her out or, you know, then she'll worry or she'll feel bad and I'm already burdening people in such and such way. And so, yeah, I better not talk to to her about it, you know, so it, it could shut them down. Yeah. I mean, I don't think it's it's a situation where it's going to make them act on their suicidal thoughts, but it could make it that now they don't want to say more. Right. Number three, you just hit on it. Suicide is selfish. Yeah. yeah. Just inspiring more guilt. Inspiring more guilt and not showing compassion for the person's pain, for the right. person in their pain. There's a a very moving article about a teenager in Denver who died five, ten years ago. I'm not sure. But when he was a very young child, he started having suicidal thoughts. And And his mother wrote the article after he died. I think he was 19 when he killed himself. And she said when he was a child, not even a teenager, he said to her something along the lines of, is, isn't it selfish of you to want me to live in pain so that you don't have to feel pain? Wow. Wow. So I think it's best mm. if we just avoid the term selfish altogether. Right. Well, here's a worse <laughs> one. Number four, suicide is cowardly. Oh, yeah. It's the so you, easy so way you just, out. Quote, you're, quote. Yeah, you're just afraid to go on with your life. Well, the world is tough. Get over it. Yeah. You know, suck it up, buttercup, right? No, that's not helpful. That's not helpful. No, and again, I think the the person who says that is probably responding to their anxiety and fear, but just not in a constructive way. Yeah, but that's a that's weird. 
Number five, you don't mean that. You don't really want to die. Mm -hmm. Number five. Yeah. I especially hear uh, adolescents whose parents say that. You don't really want to die. And then they're not going to tell you. You know, well, my... Without sharing anything, any specific thing, because there's HIPAA around that, what do people say to you when somebody has said that to them? Can they? Can you relay how that might make someone feel? Yeah, I mean, I think it, the the most important thing is it makes them feel alone, and that they, you know, that here it takes a lot of courage for many people to share their suicidal thoughts with somebody. It's something they've debated for days, weeks, months, and then they finally work up the nerve to do it. And the person kind of scoffs at them and right. says, you don't really mean that. And, and then the, pers- the person with suicidal thoughts is thinking, well, I can't tell them anymore because they think I'm lying or overreacting or being melodramatic. Right. So Num- it's just not helpful. Right. Number six, you have so much to live for. Yeah. False hope. Well, and, and that's one of those that can be helpful to some people, but it it just – it discourages the person from saying more. Right. You know, so that's really my intent with these is we want to invite people to share with us. Yeah, just kind of a soothing reminder, right? Yeah. Providing I mean, a little bit of hope that – that um Really, there's there's going to be another day if you if you want it. Could you say it that way? I mean, you know, the sun could come out tomorrow and make you feel better. Is that ridiculous? Well, I would I would challenge people to to not to at first because I do think there's a time and a place to try to get motivational and to you know to try to help the person think differently. But at first, when they come to you and they disclose they're thinking of suicide, I would just encourage you to listen and right. and don't try to fix invite it. their story exactly yeah. and just i mean somebody says i i want to kill myself the response can be you must really be hurting tell me right. more right tell me more i use that all the time when we're trying to find unmet needs with people that can't communicate with us with cognitive impairment and memory loss tell me more just somewhere deep in the recesses of their mind they can try to say something that's going to get you to where you're understanding them. Mm-hmm. If you just listen with your heart and your soul, that's kind of what you're saying, right? Well, just to facilitate the person telling you more. Right. You know, and to not close the door in their face. Right. Things could be worse. That's number seven. Oh, that, <laughs> I'm not sure how helpful that is. Yeah. Things could be worse. You know, you could have no money. You could have no place to live. So why are you feeling so bad about your situation? It's not that bad. Right? Well, I, I do think there are people where that is powerful and it helps them to have gratitude for what they do have rather than oh, looking at what they don't yeah, have. I like that. Yeah. All right. But again, there's a time and a place. Right. You know, so yeah. if someone discloses they're thinking of suicide, let's first understand. Right. Right. You know, and, and listen non-judgmentally mm-hmm. without resorting to pep talks, problem solving, right. platitudes. Yeah. Us fixers in the world have a habit of doing that, right? Here's, well, it, it, I think it's well-intentioned to help the other person. But then again, it's also that it's very hard to sit with somebody in their pain. That's true. You know, and so it's something that we do for ourselves too. Mm-hmm. And it's why people like that 14-year-old girl – And my friend Kylie, don't say anything to anybody. Mm -hmm. I didn't. You don't want to disappoint people. You don't want to give up the ghost. You don't want to, you know, let anybody close enough in to see what's really going on in your day. If that that girl hadn't have had, if that child had not have had a diary, her parents never would have answers. They're not the answers that they wanted, but their answers. She had a diary. That was that was good. Yeah, when I attempted suicide in my master's program, I didn't tell anybody except my therapist what I was experiencing. Yeah. That's deep. So here's one. Other people have problems worse than you, and they don't want to die. There's yeah. homeless people on the street. They're sitting on the corner begging. What are you complaining about, right? Uh, 
not valid. Not validating either. Right. Ooh, yeah. that's a good way to say it. I yeah. like that. So That's why you're a good therapist. <laughs> Suicide is a permanent solution to a temporary problem. I do have to say that, that that has helped many of my adolescent clients. They they kind of cling to that statement, yeah. you know, and so it is helpful. But again, there's a time and a place. Right. I can see where that one could actually be helpful. People you in know? the suicide prevention community hate it because really? they don't think suicide should be touted as a solution. Well, we're going to get to that in just a minute, but uh, so hold that thought. The tenth one is you will go to hell if you die by suicide. Yep. That is widely held in many cultures, yep. uh, many religions. Um, that's where I think the shame and the let's keep it a secret and um, even families don't want to tell people that their loved one passed away by that. I've heard people say – you know, they had cancer we didn't know about or something trying to make excuses for someone taking their own life because of this of the shame of it, that they're afraid that they didn't go to heaven. Yeah. I that that breaks my heart. Yeah. That breaks my heart. I, I mean I don't feel like wow. I hate that people think that way. Yeah, and it doesn't help. I mean I don't like to use the word hate and I've used it like four times. <laughs> Well, this is an emotional topic, <laughs> right? <laughs> it, it, it inflames emotions, but yeah. um, you know, and and people may believe that, and it's also useful to know that the major religions now have an allowance for if somebody wasn't in a, a rational state of mind. Oh, that's good. Then I mean, they're not considered to be damned. Quote, quote. Well. For whatever that's worth, if that makes somebody feel better. So you just said something a minute ago um, about different intentional reasons. Um, I can't remember exactly what you said. Well, I said, hold I said, that thought. I said people don't – people in the suicide prevention field don't like the phrase suicide as a permanent solution for a temporary problem because they don't think suicide should be billed as a solution. And then I've talked with many people who themselves have suicidal thoughts who don't like the phrase because they say it's minimizing and invalidating their problems because they may not be temporary. Correct. So that brings us to a whole nother thing. Um, I just posted today on my uh, website about questions that pop up all the time. Uh, yesterday, the New Jersey governor signed into legislation the right to die for that state. And needless to say, uh, people went crazy over it, uh, pro and and against. Um, so the questions I get from my, my uh, caregiver nation and my friends with diagnosis is, well, how about people with Alzheimer's or Parkinson's disease? And so I wrote something this morning explaining why it doesn't apply to them. Um, and really, there's just two caveats to the whole thing, even in the different uh, nationwide legislations. And one is you have to be in the last six months of a chronic illness that is terminal. And uh, nobody knows when that last six months is going to be for a person with Alzheimer's or Parkinson's. It can drag on for years. It can come really fast. We have no uh, globe that tells us, you know, no crystal ball that tells us, no time frame. So in most cases, that wouldn't work for them anyway. The second caveat is that you have to be uh, cognitively sound, um, be able to answer questions about your own care, take the medication yourself. And uh, our friends with diagnosis are in a state that they couldn't possibly do that in the last six months in 99% of the cases. So those two reasons alone um, wouldn't qualify. Now, having said that, I want to say I'm not placing any judgment. I'm not saying, yay, go end your life if you have Alzheimer's or something like that. I don't mean that at all. I love my friends with Alzheimer's and different uh, various dementias. But I also want to respect their feelings about their future. And I do my best to provide strategies and techniques to help them live resiliently uh, as best they can, overcoming obstacles and adversity. But this is serious stuff, Stacy. It is. It's serious. It's life and death. It is. 
Yeah. So chronic illnesses and stuff, um, your thoughts? What do you want to, what do you want to say on that piece? Well, it's interesting because, you know, the death with dignity laws or what some people call physician assisted suicide laws, they, as you said, they apply only to people with a terminal condition with a prognosis of six months or less. And so often in the comment section of my website, there's 6,000 comments. So yeah. <laughs> it, it's, it's a lively um, uh, uh, Dialogue. <laughs> creature of its own uh, right. sometimes. Right. And often the comments say those laws discriminate against people with mental illness because mental illness isn't recognized as a terminal illness and especially not with a definable prognosis of six months or less. Right. And so they complain that this is dis- discrimination against people with mental illness, that they're being treated differently. But, but people with so-called physical illness also aren't – um, given the right to death with dignity under the law unless they have that six-month prognosis. Right. So to me, it's not mental, physical. It's terminal, non-terminal. And then, you know, people can get into an argument of, well, but mental illness is terminal. But that's – there's not a lab test. Right. There's not an X-ray there's not an MRI or so anything true. So true. where yes. health providers can look at the person and say, mm, yeah, they're going to die by suicide within six months, so we should help them right. die by suicide now. Right. I mean, it, it's, it seems absurd to even say that out loud, but yeah. it is what it is, right? Well, I want to make sure that in the next few minutes we tell folks where they can go if mm-hmm. they're struggling. So I uh, yes, I, I, I don't want to be totally heavy on the painful aspects without right. any kind of hope and resources. Exactly. So <laughs> we've got about eight minutes left. Let's talk about what they can we can do to help them. So the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline is one eight hundred two seven three eight two five five. I'm gonna say that one more time. National Suicide Prevention Lifeline is Eight hundred two seven three eight two five five. If they're not in the United States, I have listeners in other places. What do yes. they do, Stacy? So on my website, speakingofsuicide dot com, uh, there's a section for that lists resources, and this is resources for people who have suicidal thoughts, for people who have a loved one who has suicidal thoughts, for people who have attempted suicide, for people who have a loved one who died by suicide. And also for mental health professionals, there's different sections of resources. So under the section for people who have suicidal thoughts, there are a couple international sources. One international source lists all the different suicide hotlines in the country. There's also um, a service out of the UK that answers emails from people. And it's called joe at samaritans.org. That's the email address. Joe is J-O. Okay. Joe at? Samaritans.org. Okay. And say your website again, speaking? Speaking of suicide.com. Okay. okay, good. So not only for the people that are contemplating this, their family members, can they go to these sites? Oh, absolutely. Okay. I mean, my website itself also has uh, categories of posts. So some of the posts are for people who have thoughts of suicide. Other posts are for family and friends of people who either are dealing with suicidal thoughts right now or have acted on suicidal thoughts and died or or survived a suicide attempt, whatever the case may be. So I don't want to say in a nutshell, I don't mean that, but if if someone is thinking this way, what what um can you offer right now just some thoughts of of some things that they should do for self help we've discussed a lot of things but if someone's uh listening to this show and they were saying what would my first steps be what what ideas would you offer to help somebody who's struggling well th- there are quite a few, and I'm not necessarily saying them in order. I'm just You're saying, not in a hurry. We've got about a good five minutes left. I'm just saying them in order of how they're coming to me in my mind. But one would be to tell somebody, you know, to tell somebody who – to talk with somebody 
And if that person isn't supportive or is invalidating or minimizing in the ways we described earlier, then to talk with somebody else. Okay. And, Fair. you know, I think it would be great if they went to a mental health professional or to some other health professional mm-hmm. for help. Um, but even if they don't, there's other ways, other people who can help them. You know, they can call the hotline. There's also a crisis text line, 741741. And they can just text that and say – Say that again, 741741? Correct. That's it? Okay. All right. So and they can text that. Yes. They can text 741741 and just text, I need to talk or help or whatever they want, and they'll get a text back. Sometimes I understand there's a wait. The person will text back and say, you know, I'll, I'll need to wait or you'll need to wait. But, but still, I mean, they'll be able to make a connection. Okay. That way. I think being alone with suicidal thoughts is very dangerous because there's – if if you have suicidal thoughts and you're not talking back to them, at least somebody else can help you to talk back to them. What about someone's fear? And I'm sorry. I just asked you to give some help. To, but what about someone's fear that if they text somebody or if they call somebody, the van's going to come and get them? Right? Yes. And that's a huge fear. One of the posts on my website is titled something like, will I be committed to a mental hospital if I tell a therapist I'm thinking of suicide? Mm-hmm. It was one of my earlier posts. So I saw that I, one. I didn't know how to write a short title. <laughs> <laughs> and um, in that post is one of the most popular on my site. I think it's had half a million views. Wow. And this is how frightened people are. Yes. And it's a legitimate fear. I mean, I have heard of therapists and hotline workers who, and teachers and parents who have overreacted and called 911 simply because the person says they're thinking of suicide, you know. And so the, the, the time to call 911 is if the person's in immediate danger. Right. Otherwise, let's listen. Well, I'll tell you how ridiculous that is. Uh, back in 1999, my dog, Merlin, was 14 years old, died. Four days later, my dad died. Oh. Out of the blue. He had lung cancer, but he had a heart attack, right? Four days later. Five weeks to the day later, my second dog died, <clears throat> who was also 14 years old. I'm traveling on the road. I'm in a hotel in Kentucky, and it hits me, and I'm bawling. I am bawling. I mean, I'm just uncontrollably crying on a business trip. Next thing I know, the police are knocking at my my door saying somebody called in the room next door and thinks that you're suicidal, right? And I'm like, I'm not suicidal. I'm distraught. I'm upset. My dad died. He was my best friend. I love my dad. My dogs both died after having him for 14 years. And all of a sudden, on a business trip, I felt lonely. I, it just all, the floodgates opened, right? Well, years later, I'm at Kaiser, because I have Kaiser, and they had on my screen that I happened to see <laughs> that I'm depressed. I never in my life said I was depressed. They, in order to get out of that situation, they had me call my health care <gasps> provider. And I called my health care provider, and I said, uh, the police are at my door. I'm distraught because my dad and my dogs died. Um, and, uh, I'm struggling with it and I was crying. They showed up and they said, we'll make an appointment when you get home, blah, 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 blah. But it stuck on my, I said, you didn't remove that. <laughs> I'm not a person that's distressed. I was upset. So I see where that fear comes from. Well, and can you just imagine for a moment if you had been an African-American man crying and the police knock on your door? And the police have a pattern in many places of treating African-American men in a way that lacks compassion and is prone to violence. You know, not all police. Right. Let, let me be clear. Yeah. But, I'm married to one. <laughs> okay, good. I'm, I'm glad I'm being clear. <laughs> yeah. Not all police. But, you know, yeah. not just just people from any marginalized group, could that could turn into – a huge confrontation. Right. And it could be very dangerous. Right. You know, someone could react in anger that the police were called, or they might refuse to let the police in, and then that ups the ante. 
Right. So so we need to be very careful about involving the police. Right. I did not give you a chance to say all the things that you needed to say to be helpful, but let's give that helpline again one more time. 800-273-8255. Speak, learning, uh, helping, what, what was your Speaking website? of suicide.com. Speaking of suicide.com. And let me just say one thing. Sure. That for people listening, if you are having suicidal thoughts, don't believe everything you think. Oh, I love that. Will you come back, Stacy? Sure, if you'd like for me to. I'd love to have you back on the show. Well, thanks for listening, folks. Deep subject today, and we'll see you next week on Dementia Resilience with Jill Lorenz. You've been listening to Dementia Resilience with Jill Lorenz. To learn more about her resources, services, classes, or to book speaking engagements, visit Jill's website at summitresiliencetraining.com. A new podcast drops every Tuesday, so join us as we learn more about dementias, resilience, and overcoming obstacles to find a positive outcome. Dementia Resilience with Jill Lorenz can be found on your favorite podcast provider. Please subscribe and give us a five-star rating. Musical and technical support provided by Brian Hunter. See you next week.